I believe we left off around line 1215 on page 101. If that's not right, somebody correct me now so we can jump forward. Um, 1205. 1205? Uh, okay, do I need to go back there? Let's see here. Yes. Okay, very briefly. From 1202 to 1214A, you get the first reference to Helax Frisian Raid. There are going to be, I can't do it anymore because my fingers are messed up. There's going to be three of these in the poem. Okay? There's this one, there's a later one, a um, little after middle, now I think I'm back. Little ways into the poem, and then there's a third one mentioned either just before or after one of the two, Beowulf's fight with the dragon. Usually if you have something mentioned that frequently, the poet's drawing attention to it. The poet wants us to think about it and connect it to um, the poem. Similarly, there are going to be at least two, I think three, Haramode references in the poem. Um, We had the first one, line 901 and following, okay? So, skipping the rest of that. Um, well, let me back up, just for a second. More than a couple minutes. When the poet makes this reference to the Frisian raid, he's jumping forward in time within the world of the poem. Right? Within the world of the poem, Beowulf's there at the land of the Shieldings, the Danes. Uh, he's just defeated Grindel and such. Uh, Hrup, get the right name, Wealthiel has given him the neck ring. Another name for that, by the way, is a twerk. Okay? Um, go to the British Museum, get to, get to the British Museum online, and you can see a bunch of these things. Okay? Um, Torque is a symbol of king, kingship, by the way. So she gives Beowulf this torque that Beowulf then gives to Helak when he returns home. Why? Everything, except for one thing, everything Beowulf receives from Hrothgar and Wealthiel, Beowulf gives to his lord. Why? They're spoils of war. When Thanes go and fight a battle for their king, Everything they get, they give to the king. What is the king then supposed to do? He takes from that and starts parceling it out to individuals. Okay? So Beowulf gives the neck ring to Helak. Helak wears it in the future when he goes off and does what? When he went in his pride looking for woe, a feud with the Frisians. He opens a feud. Right? He like dies in this. This Frisian raid is alluded to in those historical sources that I've mentioned before. Okay? Bear in mind, his name may mean lack thought. So if you name lack thought, what does it really mean? Stupid. <laughs> That's kind of what he like is. And Beowulf talks about, or the poet, excuse me, talks about how a lesser warrior, warrior looted the corpses mown down in battle. Gidish men held that killing field. That kind of implies that the Geats win, right? Mm, it's not what happens. The Geats, well, as with so many things, it all depends on one's perspective. The Geats lose. They get slaughtered. Apparently, however, the Frisians also get slaughtered. Because one man lives. Beowulf. So the Geats get killed. Beowulf doesn't die. He slaughters the rest of the Frisians. And then he leaves to go home. The poet is going to tell us later on. Beowulf leaves to go home swimming. He swims from northern Europe. Coast. To the land of the Swede, uh, Geats. Okay. Oh. Left out. Carrying 
the armor of 30 men, male shirts and such. Okay. Sound like anybody around here can do that? Tony Stark? No. Not even any Marvel guys, marvelous guys. So from the Frisian's land, does that mean like he went up and around Denmark? Yes. Because Frisian land is Northwest Europe. All right? So he jumps in the North Sea, swims, goes up around Denmark to past the Isle of Zealand, where Shield's people are, to southern Sweden. Okay? One of the ways Mitchell and Robinson, a couple other scholars, get around that, it's part of what's called the demarvelizing of Beowulf, is they say, no, he didn't really swim, he rode. He was in a boat. says. So, Wealthiel then stands before everybody and that's when, yes? I want to do the, uh, if it's like a work of fiction. That's a good question. I've never understood it. And I like, I generally like Fred Robinson's criticism of Babel. Um, Dirk, I assume the attempt is to try to make Beowulf more human, to make the poem more historical in that sense. Because that's really what? It, impossible. It's really out there, fantasy stuff. Okay? Uh, Grindel has a spell woven. Grindel. Fantasy stuff, right? I mean, just, just start there. Okay, dragons, okay, yeah, we've got to push those aside. Those aren't the important things. The important things are the customs, the, the behaviors, the giving and receiving of gifts, all those things that deal with real human society. That's, you know, prior to Tolkien, that's what everybody looked at, and then some after post-Tolkien, that's kind of what they go back to, because Tolkien says the monsters are, are central to the poem, okay? And it's Tolkien's essentially in that essay. I posted the essay. You can read it. It will take you a couple hours. Um, you don't. You're not required to. Okay? You do need to know that Tolkien wrote the essay, what it's called, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, Tolkien says the monsters are there because they represent things. I mean, yes, they're physically there, but they also stand in for something else. And the dragon ultimately stands in for chaos. And notice, Beowulf kills it. Doesn't mean he destroys chaos, but Beowulf is destroyed in the process. Chaos, you know, kind of wins in that sense. So, she gives Beowulf the neck ring. She says, enjoy it, be bold, prosper well, blah, blah, blah. Be mild in counsel to these boys. Because remember, at this point, we have that tableau verbally painted for us. We have Rock are here, wealthy out, hovering around, walking back and forth, whatever. Hrovel sitting next to him, opposite them across the table, Frederick Brockman, her two sons, young boys, we're told, Beowulf right in the middle. So she addresses Beowulf in the hearing of everybody else, or at the very least in the hearing of everybody else right around here. Maybe guys way over here in the corner can't hear. They probably don't want to hear. So she says, be bold and clever, and to these boys be mild in counsel. I will rem remember you for that. What does that mean to be mild in counsel? Well, one thing it definitely means is don't go up to Hrethric and go, Hrethric, pick a fight with, you know, pick an enemy. Don't advise them to go off half-cocked, we would say, okay? It can also mean be mild in counsel. The word there for counsel, if I remember correctly, is red. That is, in advice, in your doings with them. Be mild to them. That is, be helpful, be gracious to them. So what might she actually be suggesting to Beowulf in the hearing of everybody else. Might. 
right? I'm admitting this is just a possibility. I'm not saying this is the way to interpret it. No, not necessarily that, because she's already told her husband, ixe on the ink is available, right? Because you have two sons, let them inherit the kingdom. Keep an eye on my boys. That might be the subtext of what she's saying. That is, keep in touch with them. Counsel them. Why? Who's sitting next to Hrothgar? Hrothulf. We've already had the illusions to problems there. She goes on. You've made it so that men will praise you far and near, forever and ever, as far as wide as the seas, blah, 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 blah. Be wild you live. Blessed, O noble men, I wish you well. Be to my sons. And now she makes it explicit. Kind in your deeds. Notice, heaping them in joys. Not bringing them joy. While they're alive, keep them happy. Keep them joyful. Watch over them. Protect them. That's probably what the be kind in deeds. Support them. Stand behind them and flex your muscles. That's essentially what a Lord Protector does or a Regent does. You have a Lord Protector or, or Regent when you have someone who is not of proper age to take control, to rule the throne. So you get somebody else who essentially stands behind and whispers in the ear. That's the person who actually makes all the decisions. In Elizabeth, pre-Elizabethan England, Edward VI, before he became actual king, was essentially a king in name only. He had an advisor, I can't remember whose name it was, who pretty much ran the show. So, here each, true, here each earl is true to the other, mild in his heart, loyal to his liege lord, the things united, the nation alert, blah, blah, blah. Is she being honest? Is she being serious? Or is something else possibly meant? What have we been told previously? Lines 1163 and following. To where the two good sat, nephew and uncle, their peace was still whole then. Still then mean what? It's not going to be, okay? Earlier, 1015 and following. Hrothgar and Hrothulf, Herat within was filled with ruins. No false treacheries did the people of the Shieldings plot at that time, implying it's going to happen. So she then says, here each, true, each earl is true to the other. I, and not a whole lot of other Baal scholars, think she's being sarcastic or ironic. One of the two, because sarcasm is a form of irony. What's her real message? I don't trust him. Rahulf, as far as I could throw him. Beowulf, you be true to these Earlings, little earls, earls in waiting. Okay. So the men drank wine. They did not know weird. The cruel fate which would come to pass for many an earl once evening came. Weird. There it is again. What will be, will be. Okay. So, Bunch of men sleep in Herod that night. Beowulf does it. He gets to sleep on an actual bed in another building. And we get a long description of Grendel's mother. She who dwelt in those dreadful waters ever since Cain killed with his blade his only father, his only brother, etc., etc. From him awoke again, we're told, you know, many monsters and such. So she comes in, and we're told, I'm skipping this up about 
Pam were fighting Grindel. She comes in and she takes just one guy. Notice she's not like Grindel. She's not greedy. She doesn't take 30. She takes one. Why? One of hers was taken. This is what I was alluded to the other day. And I can't, I, I've got it in my office. I think the guy's last name, I think that won't be my name. A guy, a person wrote a dissertation on law, essentially in Beowulf, and how various people have the law more or less on their side according to the battles they do. And his argument, partially at least, is that Grendel's mother, she, she's pretty much following the law. Literal Anglo-Saxon written law. She is justified in her actions. Why? Beowulf killed her son. Okay? Where does she know who Beowulf is? No, she doesn't. Does she know where Beowulf lives? Yes, she does. Herod. Okay? Does the fact that her son had gone to Herod every night for the last 12 years and killed 30 men have anything to do with it? No, it doesn't. Okay? Beowulf begins a feud with the Grindelkin by killing Grindel. Now you could say, well, Beowulf is resolving the feud that Grindel opened up against Hrothgar. And that can be argued. And one can, in the Anglo-Saxon legal tradition, hire somebody else to do one's dirty work, which is kind of what Hrothgar does with Beowulf. Okay? Here's where her claim, if at all, breaks down. Beowulf isn't the one who kills, um, Asherah isn't the one who kills her son. Beowulf is. She should kill Beowulf. She doesn't know who the actual killer is. She knows it's somebody in this hall. So she kills somebody in that hall. Beowulf is then going to, go, I'm going to skip a bunch, Beowulf is then going to attack her. According to Anglo-Saxon tradition and law, she is entirely in the right in protecting herself. Because Beowulf is the invader. He invades her space, literally. Jumping into the water, that's her domain. In fact, we're going to be told she ruled that area for 50 years. It's the first time we have a 50-year Rain mentioned in the poem. We're going to get two more. Okay, So, she comes, takes Asherah, Hrothgar's best friend, closest confidant. He's going to describe him as his shoulder companion in every battle. That is, he was the one who literally stood next to him, formed the shield wall. The people you want on either side are the ones you trust the most. That was Asherah. Okay? So, Hrothgar's told, and what are we told he does? 1308 or so, seven. The wise old king, gray-bearded warrior, was grieved at heart when he learned that he no longer lived. The dearest of men, his chief thing, was dead. He sorrows, grieved at heart. Beowulf comes in. He's fetched, we're told. In, has he been told anything? No, he hasn't. He isn't told by whoever brings him in, oh, by the way, don't say anything, you know, happy or joyful because Asherah is dead, Hrothgar is. He comes in and we're told, with his words, he addressed the wise one, Lord of the English, asked him whether the night had been agreeable. Did you sleep well, Hrothgar? Did you have a good evening? Hrothgar, ask not of joys. Why? Sorrow is renewed. Metaphorically, at the very least, what position is Hrothgar back in? Sitting on his you-know-what, moaning, mourning, whining, complaining. Asherah is dead, blah, blah, blah. Okay? And then he says... 
1331 and following. I do not know where that ghoul went gloating with its carcass, rejoicing in its feast. She, he knows it's a she, she avenged that feud in which you killed Grendel yesterday evening. Notice Hrothgar, what Hrothgar has just done. He put the blame on Beowulf for killing Grendel. In your violent way with a crushing vice grip, for he had diminished and destroyed my people for far too long. And that's his justification for what Beowulf did. Did, not done. <laughs> and then he explains what? That maybe Beowulf should have been told before. I have heard countrymen and hall counselors among my people report this. They've seen two such creatures, great march stalkers, one had the shape of a woman, the other misshapen, marched the exiles past in the form of a man. They knew no father, whether before him had been begotten any more mysterious spirits. That is, the people didn't know whose father Grendel was, etc., or even who Grendel's mother's father was. Okay? And then he gives a description of the entrance or the location of where they live. That murky land they hold, wolf-haunted slopes, windy headlands, awful fen paths, where the upland torrents plunge downward under the dark crags, the flood underground. So, there's a waterfall. Okay? It's not far hence, that is from here, measured in miles, that the mirror stands. Over it hangs a grove, hoar-frosted, a firm-rooted wood looming over the water. I had written up here the other day, Translated to English in Vision of St. Paul in Blickling Homily 17, an old English homily, sermon. Why? They both contain almost the exact same description of a pond, a mere, a lake, whatever you want to call it, with a waterfall, with craggy rocks, and on the rocks grow these trees that are always seemingly covered in hoarfrost. In both of these sources, <coughs> it's a description of the entrance to hell. Poet doesn't say that here. But what this shows is that at the very least, all three sources are working from a common image that was somehow prevalent, or the Beowulf poet, author, was familiar with one or both of these, or one or both of these were familiar with one or both of the others. There's no way three separate, because it's pretty clear they're three separate authors, there's no way three separate authors can all come up with the exact same image, okay? And it is kind of, you know, metaphorically, it is kind of the entrance to hell, right? So, he goes on and says, you do not know, 1377, this fearful place where you might find the sinful creature. Seek it if you dare. Now, his men have already been there, right? They traced Grendel's trail to that lake. Beowulf did not go on that journey. That's where she is. I dare you to go find her. If you do, and you're victorious, notice two ifs, you reward. You'll just get a lot of reward. Beowulf. Sorry not, wise one. What's he really saying? Modern English. Suck it up. Come on. Quit your crying. Wise one, not strong one. Bill's kind of implying. Wisdom means 
Every time something bad happens, you don't just turn into a puddle of tears, which seemingly is what happens to Hagar. It is always better to avenge one's friend than to mourn over much. In other words, that fourfold dramatic ethic demands what? An action, not an emotion. Vengeance. Each of us must await the end of this world's life. Now, that's kind of a cold thing to say at this moment. Because what does it mean? It's kind of what Hamlet's stepfather and mother say to Hamlet in Act 1. When they all come in and Hamlet's there all dressed in black. Well, it's common that your father died. His father died. His father died before him. Guess what? Each one of them had to deal with their father's death. What are they saying? Suck it up, Hamlet. Death happens. Each of us must await the end of this world's life. Yesterday, last night, whatever, it was Asherah's time. His sand came through the hourglass. Let him who can bring about fame before death. Why? According to that Germanic pagan mythology, fame, reputation, glory, it's the only thing that lives on. Because once you're dead, you're dead. And there is no eternal life, right? I mean, that's what the whole passage in Bede about the coming of Christianity was about. What's his point? Do something glorious. Now's your opportunity. Come on, Rothgar. The old man leapt up, thanked the Lord, the mighty God, for that man's speech. Thank you, Beowulf, because what has Beowulf said between the unliving man is gone, line 1389, and when Hrothgar speaks? He goes, Today you must endure patiently all your woes, as I expect you will. You have to patiently endure. Notice what you don't get to do. You don't get to off yourself. You, you don't get to commit suicide. Suicide's not in the Germanic custom. Okay? He's also said, yeah, I'll do it. Okay? How does Beowulf prepare for this battle differently than he did for the battle with Grindel? It's worse clothing. <laughs> Say that again? It's worse clothing. He wears clothing. What else? What's among his clothing? He goes fully armed. Corslet, helmet. He even gets another sword. Not two. He switches swords. He exchanges swords with Unferd, we're going to be told. Um, lines 1455 and following. Unferd has now been somewhat chastened. And he comes up to Beowulf and goes, Mr. Beowulf, my sword. It's given a name. If an item is named, that means it's an heirloom. That means it's valuable. That means it has significance. Okay? 1488. He let Unferth have that ancient heirloom, that is, the one he had, the one Beowulf had, that well-known him, a man may have my wave pattern sword, Hard edge blended. He says, with thrifting, I will seek, or I shall win honor and fame, or I'll die trying. Okay? Is there a problem with accepting Unferth's sword? What have you been told about Unferth? He's a kinslayer. See, this is part, I think, of the rationale. Not I think, it is. Part of the rationale that some Babel scholars use, this is part of the argument, to use that Beowulf's whole comment about kinslaying and Unferth, it's all just part of the flinging game. It's not serious. But remember, the poet said that also. Not in the world of the poem. That Unferth was a kinslayer. Can we assume? Okay. Swords are very valuable. They're expensive. They're difficult to make. And if it's an heirloom, that means it's 
very well made, and it's been around a long time. Not the kind of thing you have too many of. Is this the sword Unferth used in his kinslaying? If it is, that's you know bad magic, so to speak. So, Beowulf, with Unferth's sword in his hand, goes to the edge of the lake, water, pond, whatever it is. Your gloss tells us, uh, your text tells us 1494, the surging sea. Almost no one thinks it's literally the ocean. Though Beowulf has done things in oceans before. And he dives into the water. The Old English tells us, Thought was when dies ere he thon a grund wong on yet in meta. Then was a while of the day. Quil dies. A while of the day or a time of the day. When we use the word while, what does it mean? Like, meanwhile, back at the top of the lake, it means time's past. Does it usually mean a minute? Two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, an hour, two. Liuza translates it, it was the space of a day, and then he does as a possible reading, or it was daylight. Okay, put it was daylight in that line. It was daylight before he could perceive the bottom. Does that make any sense at all? Is he jumping in at nighttime? And so a lot of time passes and then daylight comes. Before he could perceive the bottom means he's at the bottom. This thing isn't 20 feet deep. The implication is it's very deep. The way it's often translated is, the way I always translate it, is it was the greater part of a day. So what's the greater part of a day? If you want to be literal... It's 12 hours and one minute. With what breathing apparatus? <laughs> this is part of the marvelousness of the poem and the marvelousness of Beowulf the character. Did I mention in here the other day? It might have been my first class. You notice anything odd about Beowulf's name? What's his father's name? Louder? Edge Theot. Um, Hrothgar. What are his two sons' names? Hrethric, Hroth, Hroth, Hrothlin, Hroth. Halfdane. What are his three sons' names? Herogar, Hrothgar, Holga. Ha, 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 ha. Hrethel. What are his sons' names? Herobald, Hathkin, Helak. We get to the Swedes, Onyanthial. What are his sons' names? Onala, Uhtura. In other words, sons' names do what with fathers' names? They alliterate. Edgetheal, <coughs> Olf. It doesn't alliterate. It violates almost a law of Germanic naming. Why? Because the poet was stupid and didn't remember that? <laughs> Clearly no. Because the poet is telling us different. Other. Capital O. Other. Beowulf ain't from around these parts, in other words. He's totally different than everybody else. And he can apparently hold his breath really, really long. Remember, he did also fight sea monsters in the middle of the ocean and was taken to the bottom of the ocean. But as soon as he hits the water, Grendel's mama knows what? He's there. It's like sonar. She, notice, she, the poet tells us. The poet knows this is the woman, or female, sorry. She who held that expanse of water, bloodthirsty and fierce, for a hundred half years, grim and greedy. 
the word that, that is held, that word can also mean ruled, controlled, wielded. It's often used to describe what a king does. She is, in a sense, queen of her territory. And she's held it for, we're told, 50 years. Later on, Hrothgar, and I think we'll get to this today, Hrothgar is going to tell us he ruled for 50 years. And then Grindel came. Later on, we're going to hear Beowulf rules for 50 years. And then the dragon comes. Notice for each one, after the 50 year come, reign, 50 year anniversary passes, there's a reversal. There's a change of fortune. For Hrothgar, it's Grindel coming. For Grindel's mother, it's Beowulf coming. For Beowulf, it's the dragon coming. So it's almost like, hey man, if you have 50 years of peace, you better leave because change is coming. So what happens? She grabs him and pulls him down to the bottom. And as she's pulling him down, sea monsters, lake monsters, whatever they are, in the water are attacking. But his mail coat protects him. Where did he get the mail coat from? Ultimately, who made it? Wayland the Smith, a god. And she takes him down and pulls him into her. The word there is, is, that's used is hova. It's the word from which we get hovel. What's a hovel? Not a word we use much. Isn't it like a poorly built house? Yeah, it's a shack. Okay? It's a poorly built place. Well, where is it? What is this really? It's a cave. It's an underwater cave that the water doesn't come up into somehow. There's air in here. How do we know there's air? There's a fire. <laughs> fire and water, yeah, they don't work. Okay? So he proceeds and he's in this air-filled cavern. He sees firelight, a glowing blaze shining brightly. Why? Why does she have a fire? Is it cold and she wants to stay warm? She lives in the freaking water. She's a water wife. That's what brim wolf means, which gets translated she wolf. Brim doesn't mean she. Brim means like you fill something to the brim, it's water. Okay? She's a water wolf. No, I've got a book at home. Dictionary of Imaginary Things and Places. I don't think it's in there. Nobody knows what that refers to. Okay? So, the worthy man saw that water witch, a great mere wife. He gave a mighty blow with his battle sword. What sword? Hrunting, Unfair sword. He did not temper that stroke, meaning he doesn't hold anything back. Temper is when you mix something with something else. He doesn't kind of go, I'm going to give her 90% and see what it does. He swings, you know, for the parking lot beyond the stadium. Where does he swing for? He's thinking, kill her in one fell swoop. He's going to do the same thing later on. Well, he does it with her later on. Different sword. He's going to do the same thing later on with the dragon. What's the difference between killing her, whatever she is, and the dragon? What does she not do that, at least in our popular consciousness, most dragons do? And not all dragons do, by the way. Breathe fire. This one does. We're going to be told he does, or it does. Is that really the smartest move? If somebody's standing next to you, and you're going to attack that person, and that person has a flamethrower... Do you go right at him? No. So we're going to see Beowulf's companion take a different tack with the dragon battle. So he hits her 
and the sword just kind of boom, bounces off. Doesn't shatter or break, just doesn't do any good. And we're told it's the first time that sword had ever failed. Now that's not a character within the world of the poem telling us, that's the poet outside the poem, several hundred years in the future, saying, oh, by the way, this mighty heirloom, it's always been successful in battle. Huh. So, Beowulf throws away that sword, not going to do him any good, and he does what? I kill Grindel with my hands, I'll kill her with my hands too. He trusts in his strength. As a man should do, if by his warfare he thinks to win long-lasting praise. Colon. Colon's not in the manuscript. What comes after the colon? It kind of fills in what comes before the colon. What should a man do if he wants to win fame? He cares nothing for his life. You have to go into battle thinking what? That, or, what's a slight rephrasing of that? I'm going to go down fighting. I'm going to give it my all. Okay? So he grabs her. And we're told he swings her around so that she falls to the ground. But then she quickly gives him requital for that. That is, she turns the tables. She reverses the situation. Notice, now it's almost like a wrestling match. And she does what? She throws him to the ground. But she doesn't do what Lisa says she does. For 1545, she sent upon her hall guest and drew her knife. Some translations read, sat down upon. The meaning of Old English off sat is disputed. Okay? Why did I say that? 1545. 1545 reads, Offset tha guest. Offset doesn't mean set upon. It just doesn't. Okay? You could quibble about, did she sit upon? Literally, off, set. She sat off that hall guest. Now that kind of implies that she's maybe sitting next to him. There are a lot of translators, a lot of glosses that do give sat upon. So she flips him on the ground and sits upon him. Why is it important, I, I would argue, for it to be sat upon? Because of these lines. Go back just a little bit. Weary he stumbled, strongest of warriors, of foot soldiers, and took a fall. Strongest of warriors, of foot warriors, and then what happens? He falls to the ground. You guys are too young to remember. Get on YouTube. Watch, watch interviews with Muhammad Ali when he was in his prime. Okay? Getting ready to fight Joe Frazier or George Foreman or somebody like that. And he taunts them. And he talks about being, you know, Stinging like a bumblebee, flying like a butterfly, and doing the rope-a-dope, where he's dancing, essentially. His feet are moving back and forth, almost as fast as you can see them. Why? Because of all the hours he spent jump roping. He was known for his footwork. Footwork is really important in boxing. Beowulf is a what? He is a foot soldier. He should be really good on his feet. That doesn't mean infantrymen. It kind of means when Beowulf took a position, took a stance, he doesn't back up. We're going to see when he fights the dragon. He says, I'm going to go and I'm never going to step to take a step back. Dragon comes at him a bunch of times and he, he takes a couple steps back. Of course, he's a lot older than two. What's my point? If he's such a good foot soldier, how in the world does he fall? It's, the implication is almost like he trips 
over his own two feet. But it's because of her. What is this? This is meant, I would argue, and a few other scholars have said this, this is not by any point a consensus opinion. Okay? This is irony. An Anglo-Saxon audience, I think, would hear that and would chuckle. This is like Muhammad Ali doing the dance with his feet and tripping. Foreman would probably just sit there and laugh at him before he starts beating the snot out of him. This is meant to be humorous. Okay? It's lost on us. A lot of Anglo-Saxon humor we don't get anymore. Why? Humor tends to be time-related. What's funny, one year, one decade, one period of time is no longer funny to another one. She sat upon her hall guest, I would argue, and drew her knife. Because sat upon kind of implies what? She went towards. So she goes towards him holding her hall knife. What is she not yet able to do? Stab him because she's still moving towards. If she's sitting on him, so he's pinned to the ground, and she stick pulls out her knife, notice one, she has a knife. And two, she drew it, meaning she has a sheath or scabbard of some kind. And she goes all psycho, moving, not crazy, you know, to stab him. His corslet protects him. But not just his corslet. On his shoulders lay the linked corslet. It defended his life, prevented the entrance. There the son of Edge now, notice, would have ended his life. Had not his armored shirt, his mail shirt, offered him help. And, holy God, brought about war victory. And then we get this long phrase that comes after God brought about war victory. How did God bring it about? Look at the language that's used. The wise Lord, ruler of the heavens. This is just renaming God. Okay. The wise Lord, ruler of the heavens, decided it rightly, easily. The next word, Sidon, is the old English word. Sidon can mean since, because, once, uh, sometimes it means thus, sometimes it can mean therefore. See how you translate that adverb is really important, or conjunction, whichever it is, is really important because it determines the order of things. Notice. Does Beowulf get victory because of his male shirt and because he stands up? And that's when God decides the victory. Does God decide the victory and then he stands up? Or does he stand up and therefore God decided the victory? You see, that's one opinion. And you get into scholarship and there's a whole bunch of other opinions. It's not clear. Because if it's the therefore, that implies that whole, what I had up here the other day, that whole Boethian note idea. That our will working in tandem with God's will. And the very fact that he was able to get up is an indicator that God desired this. Okay? And what happens? He gets up and he sees a blade. We're not told exactly at this point where he sees the blade. But we are told it's a big blade. It's the old work of giants. Because it's the old work of giants, it doesn't mean it is a gigantic, like 10 foot long blade. Giants generally are not just somebody, you know, like the guy who holds the Guinness Book of World Records now for the tallest person alive. He's some guy in Kazakhstan, he's like eight foot, 10 inches tall, okay? That's not a giant. Giants were thought to be 
15, 20, etc. feet tall. So you would expect somebody that tall would have a much bigger blade. The only thing we're told about the size of the blade is no other human is strong enough to wield it. That could just refer to the weight of the blade. Okay? But we are told it is the old work of giants. So he grabs its hilt, and seemingly it's in one fluid motion. He sees the sword, he reaches for it, he grabs it, Grendel's mother's coming again, just one mighty swing, takes her head off. She fell to the floor, the sword was bloody, the soldier rejoiced, the flames suddenly go whoosh. Why? All we're told is the flames gleamed, a light glowed within, even as from heaven the firmament's candle shines clearly. From heaven, not from the sky. Okay? It's almost like this is, you know, a new day. It's a new beginning, so to speak. Almost like. I'm not saying that's what it is. So, he then takes that sword. Notice, the blade is still intact at this point. He's killed Grindel's mother. He goes off and he finds Grindel's body. How? Gore. <laughs> Follow the trail. He chops Grindel's head off. What happens to the body? <laughs> Why? Bloating. Find a dead animal on the side of the road. I'll just, you know, I'll do what Hrothgar does to Beowulf. I dare you. Get a sword or a stick or something and hit it. Then you're going to end up with guts all over you because it's going to go if it's been sitting there and hasn't been eaten at all. Okay? Soon the troops saw it. What happens between 1590 and 1591? What has our poet left out that, you know, in poorly written novels or some radio programs in the 30s and 40s and 50s would be done. Especially you would hear this in the radio. I grew up listening to old radio. My dad recorded and stuff. Meanwhile, that's what's missing. Meanwhile, back at the top of the lake. So Beowulf chops off Grendel's head. And what happens seemingly simultaneously at the top of the lake? That water starts to bubble again. Only it's not water, it's blood welling up. Does that mean, literally, he chops off Grendel's head and blood starts spewing out through this cave? Don't know. It means it at least metaphorically, though. Something happens so that the water starts doing this. And part of it, we're going to find out, it's kind of a purifying. The water is cleansing itself, seemingly. Okay, so the people at the top of the lake see this in what is assumed. Those who kept watch on the water with Hrothgar, all turbid with the waves and trouble, the sea, the sea stained with blood. The gray-bearded elders spoke together about the good one, that is Beowulf, and said what? He ain't coming back. They think Beowulf's blood. He's dead. To many it seemed that the sea wolf had destroyed him. 1600. The night hour came. Old English. Excuse me. Thaw com non dies. Then came nine of the day. Okay. Significance. You ever heard the phrase, the ninth hour? You ever read it anywhere? It's not a Germanic system of keeping time. It is totally foreign to the Germanic peoples. It's not foreign to the Anglo-Saxon Christian tradition. It is foreign to the Anglo-Saxon Germanic tradition. Why? Because it's a Judeo-Christian form of timekeeping. 
first hour, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, etc. And then in the tradition of the church, those are names for hours of prayers. And then you have matins and compline and vespers also. So there are seven times a day. Why? Because David says seven times a day will I pray to you. All right? Ninth hour, what else? Am I familiar at all with the Gospels? It's at the ninth hour that Christ dies. It's at the sixth hour that he's crucified. The ninth hour, he says, into their hands, Father, I commend my spirit. And oh, darkness hovers upon the face of the earth, all that kind of stuff. This is a clear biblical illusion. A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N. I once had a student write a paper, not for this class, but for something else, on biblical illusions. I-L-L-U-S-I-O-N-S. You know, I just kept thinking, Princess Bride, word does not mean what you think it means. <laughs> the ninth hour came. What is being alluded to? What is being linked? Beowulf, Christ. Okay. Beowulf isn't Christ. Don't, don't misread don't misinterpret or misunderstand. He's, he could be a type. We'll talk about that later. Ninth hour came, and the Shieldings do what? They abandon the headland. That is, they go back home. Why? He's dead, they think. The guests, who are the guests? Your footnote tells you the geese who came, geese who came with Beowulf. They sat sick at heart, stared into the mirror. They wished but did not hope that they would see Beowulf again. Go back to the possible biblical story. Where are the disciples when Christ is crucified? All but one, at least. Take that back. All but two. Hiding. One version, one of the Gospels says that they sat away at a great distance. That is, they watched the crucifixion from a distance. Bear in mind, it's on a hill, so you can see it from pretty much anywhere around Jerusalem. Okay? With the exception of John, who stays with the Marys at the foot of the cross, and who's not there and who's not staying with the other disciples? Judas, who hung himself. Okay? What are the disciples thinking at the moment of the crucifixion? And we know this because of what's said in the Gospels about the next day and the day after that. They gather together in the upper room, doors locked, because they're afraid. One, Jesus is dead. Two, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the rulers have it out for them. They're thinking they're going to be next. Okay. Meanwhile, back down at the bottom of the lake, the sword begins to melt. Why? Why does the sword melt after Beowulf chops off Grendel's head? but not after he chops off Grindel's mother's head. Because some are decapitated now? Say that again? Both of them are now decapitated? Because both of them are decapitated. Is there some unwritten rule that the sword can't melt until we don't know? I, I just throw that question out because we don't know. We do know Grindel had what protecting him while he was alive. He wove a spell around himself about swords. Could be the breaking of the spell. It's not important to the poet. Okay. How come um, Beowulf and Grindel's mother don't have any dialogue? Like, while they're good, fighting? Good question. I don't know the answer. Other than, we don't know that she can speak. Hmm. Are we told of any dialogue Grindel has? Does he say anything? Not that we know. We know he exults in his heart when he sees all those geetish geet dainties, you know, lying out in front of him like desserts. That's it. We're told what he thinks, so he's capable of thought. Okay. Um, are we told? I don't have time to go back through it. Are we told what she thinks? Not really. Okay. Plus, the situation's a little tense. He's a hi, my name's Beowulf. I'm here to kill you and take your son's head. Um, 
What really would you say? So, it melts. Yes? Sorry, one more question. That's um, okay. Why, so it seems like she has a lot of reason, like she went to the thing and she killed one person and then she left. And it seems like she's just going to go back to her thing and like mourn her son or whatever. So why is it necessary for Vale to even go and kill her? Because they don't know that she might only be one and done. What's going on in their mind? Oh, I mean, you could have thought after the first night, Grindel would be satisfied. I mean, then he comes again and he does it for 12 years. They might be thinking, I think the assumption is, that they assume she's going to come back again the next night. So, while you're here, and you're the monster killer, would you mind, you know. But again, that to me brings up more the question of why doesn't, it, and this is plot, okay? And it would destroy the plot. Why doesn't Hrothgar tell Beowulf there are two of these things? Why does he wait till one's done and then the second one kills his favorite person? Probably because it wouldn't advance the plot. Okay? So, the ice melts, uh, excuse me, the sword melts, and then the poet gives us a metaphor like when ice melts in the spring. When the father loosens the frost fetters, unwraps the water's bonds, he wields power over times and seasons. That is the true maker. Again, the maker, the father, what? Total control. God wished, willed for this to happen. Okay? So, Beowulf grabs the sword hilt and one other thing and dives upward. How about you? To me, that's I've been teaching this thing for 30 years. It still bothers me. Because when you dive, you do what? You go down. He dives upward. You imagine it takes the space of a day again. And he's carrying Grindel's head in the sword hilt. Oh, and he picks up Unferth's sword. Okay? He does get that back. And he comes to land, and his men see him, and they're all overjoyed and happy and pleased and everything. So they're going to make their way back to Heron. Who's going to carry Grindel's head? And how? Notice, Beowulf carries it swimming or pulls it, right? How are you doing? Four of his men are given charge of carrying it. And we're told they carry it on a battle pole. Does that mean one pole shoved up through the neck and these four men are like here, 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 here? Be very awkward. Or is it like one of my students in my previous class suggested, they've got their poles like this and they're carrying it like you'd carry a coffin if you've ever been a pallbearer, okay? And so they're each carrying it like this up on the shoulder and it's sitting in between and you know, so they take steps and it kind of bounces and jiggles. Or the way I think it's done, do they have their spears jammed up, four of them, inside Grindel's neck into the head? So you have one here, one here, one here, and one here. I think it's that, which is telling us something about the size of Grendel's head. It's not my size. It's not the size of the top of this lectern. It's big. It's probably six, eight feet in diameter, which would then say what about the rest of his body? Big boy. A really big boy, okay? They get to Hera, and then what do they do? Do they march up to Hrothgar's throne, holding this thing like this? No. Go away. Go away. No, what do they do? Okay, before they come in, what are we told what, about the Danes? What are they doing? Let's see here. Da, 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 da. He entered there for 1647, then where men were drinking. Okay. What time of day is it? It was the ninth hour when they thought Beowulf died. That was when Beowulf killed Grindel. Ninth hour is 
about three o'clock, no, ninth hour is noon. We don't know how long it took Beowulf to swim back up, but it's probably safe to say it's sometime later in the afternoon, okay? And they're just, you know, throwing them back. But seemingly what they always do, Beowulf and his men get there, they take the head off the pole or poles, they put it on the ground and they drag it by its hair so he's not bald. And as they drag it, what happens on the nice, newly cleaned floor of Herod? Well, the neck, remaining part of it, is being dragged across the stone flag floor. It's probably a little uneven if you've ever walked on stone flag floors, like in some old cathedrals and stuff. And so it's bouncing around and little bits of brain matter and blood and stuff are... Because we're told, a grisly spectacle for the men and the queen... What is Grendel's head symbolic of for them? What's it proof of? Let me put it that way. One, Grendel's dead. What is it further proof of for them? Safety. Louder? Safety, okay. Grendel's mother's dead. How do we know that? Or why would they assume that? He, he wouldn't be back and he wouldn't have Grendel's head. Okay? So... Beowulf says, look what we've done. We. He doesn't say, look, I have achieved a mighty glory. Me, Beowulf, it all goes to me. Look, he says, we have brought you gladly these gifts. So he gives him the head, a trophy of sorts, you know, and says, I would have died if God had not guarded me. Notice, he doesn't even attribute anything to the male shirt. It was God that saved him. And then he turns to Unferth. Unferth. Hurting's a great sword. Didn't do any good for me. Okay. But the ruler of mankind granted to me, 1662, that I might see on the wall a gigantic old sword hanging, glittering. Hanging means one of two things to me. Where have we seen a sword and a wall before? When Sigamund kills the dragon, he pierces it so strongly the sword sticks in the wall. Beowulf says, I found a sword. How does he put it? Hanging, glittering from the wall. Is it hanging like... My dad used to have, when he was alive, in his study, some old swords. One of them was a Civil War sword that his brother dug up somewhere. Hanging on the wall. He had some hanging from the ceiling. We would automatically know if a minor earthquake occurred because you could go in there and see these things swinging, okay? Because sometimes you can't feel them. Why does she have a sword hanging on the wall? What does that imply? Yeah, decoration. Or is it hanging, like, hanging that way, thrust into the wall? And so the hilt is out. And what does he do, he tells us. He saw the hilt, he grabs it, and I think the implication is one movement, he swings, takes her head off, okay? Then he gives Hrothgar the hilt of that sword. And we're told. Hrothgar spoke, 13, uh, 1687. But then Hrothgar doesn't speak till 1700. Hrothgar spoke, and then for 13 minutes, he looks at the, at the hilt. And the poet tells us what Hrothgar sees and reads on the hilt. When the flood slew rushing seas, the race of giants, they suffered awfully. What flood? Is this Noah's flood? in which the Nephilim died, the Nephilim, the offspring, according to Genesis, of the sons of God who went into the daughters of men, who are the sons of God. Those aren't the children of Adam and Eve, okay? Is it that flood? Possibly. There is a Germanic myth of a flood. 
just as there is in every culture around the world. In the Germanic myth, it's the frost giants who are killed. So he reads all this, but then we're told he reads one other thing. Yes? Um, so you said that there is a myth of a cult, or there is a myth of a flood in every culture. Every culture around the world that we know of has a mythic tale of a flood engulfing the world. Yep. Do they all involve giants? No, not that I can think of. The Babylonian, the Epic of Gilgamesh, doesn't refer to giants specifically. But it, they're all, the, the Babylonian one, the Greek one, um, they all refer to the washing away of evil, essentially. It's one of those human, Jung would call it, you know, part of the collective unconscious, that there's something of, in us that kind of requires this notion, okay? So, he also reads, inscribed, apparently in runes, who the sword was made for. This is pretty standard. I mean, in real history, a whole bunch of early Germanic to as late as the Vikings, 1000 AD, swords and objects have been discovered that have inscribed on them, I was made for. In fact, one of the oldest inscriptions in runic was on a drinking horn. It no longer exists. It was destroyed. But somebody, uh, it was destroyed. Am I thinking right? Part of me wants to say it was destroyed in the cotton fire. Might have been. Uh, but it was transcribed. It, drawings were made so that we know exactly what this thing looks like. And it says something like, um, I, so-and-so's name, made this. And it's written in one of the earliest forms of the Germanic languages. It's written in Gothic, okay, which is the earliest surviving form of Germanic. There's a um, there's a jewel in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. It's called the Alfred Jewel, and it has a bearing to something we talked about earlier. You know, I talked about Alfred had these translations that he had done, and he per himself wrote a preface to Gregory's Pastoral Care. In that preface, Alfred talks about sending along with a copy of the book a jewel. And the jewel and the book are sent to various bishops. That is, he has ones made for each of them. Well, early, uh, excuse me, late 19th century, somebody was digging around somewhere, and they discovered this jewel. It's got a gold loop at the top and something down below, and inside, under glass, is this glass image made out of little pieces of glass image of a face, okay? And it has, in runic letters on the outside, Alfred Mitch, and I can't remember the word that was used for made. Alfred made me, is what it says. Or it can be translated, Alfred had me made. And it's thought the image is supposed to be Alfred the Great. It's one of, apparently, the five or six bookmarks that he had sent along with the book to these bishops. So the, the idea of having a name, I was made for so-and-so or I was made by so-and-so, entirely um, real world stuff, okay? Then Hrothgar finally speaks and he gives us what is colloquially or usually called either Hrothgar's homily, why, because that alliterates, or Hrothgar's sermon, sometimes Hrothgar's tale. Don't think either, don't think tale is very good. So, he's just looked at the hilt, and the hilt seemingly prompts him to think these words. One may indeed say, if he acts in truth and right for the people, remembers all old guardian of his homeland, that this earl was born a better man. Better. Comparative adjective. What does it always mean or imply or require? That car is better than this car, the other car. So if he is born a better man, better than me, 
better than Unferth, clearly. Himself before. Himself, himself who? Whoever he's talking about. Well, he's talking, he's talking about Beowulf. He's saying, this man was born a better man. Reborn when he pulls his sword out. Could be. That's, you know, it, we don't get the comparative. We don't get the second part. Beowulf, my friend, your glory is exalted throughout the world over every people. Really? Is it? Have they heard about his glorious deeds, killing Grendel and Grendel's mother? No. He killed Grendel's mother that day. He killed Grendel the night before that day. Or two nights before. He's talking about the deeds Beowulf did before he even came to the land of the Danes. Those tales, Hrothgar says, we've already heard about Beowulf. Okay. You hold it all with patient care and temper strength with wisdom. I referred the other day to an article, Fortitudio et Sapientiae, as the controlling or as the theme of Beowulf by R.E. Caskey. Fortitudo, strength, can also mean courage. Strength refers to one's actual physical abilities. Fortitudo, one's courage, bravery, and sapientiae, wisdom. He says, Beowulf, you do what? You temper one with the other. He mixes them. What does that mean? He's not over strong or brave, and he's not lacking in wisdom. He knows when to use his strength and when not to. Really? Um, what, what's the author? R.E. Caskey. Pretty sure it's E. K-A-S-K-E. I want to say it was in the Journal of English and Germanic Philology. 1968, something like that. <clears throat> okay, so he says, to you I shall fulfill a friendship. As we've said, you'll become a comfort everlasting to your own people. Everlasting. You will forever be a comfort to your people. Yeah, see, Rothgar's losing a little bit of this, of the wisdom. Why? Because Beowulf isn't going to be an everlasting comfort to his people. Jump to the end. Anglo-Saxon poet doesn't care about suspense, so I won't either. Beowulf's going to die. Guess what's going to happen to his people after his death? The poet, through the voice of a messenger, is going to tell us they're going to get wiped out. Historically, real-world stuff. Sometime after... The year 700 or so, the Geats disappear. Totally wiped out. There are no surviving Geats. Nobody knows what happened to them. They just, I mean, like, they disappeared. Little green men came and take them away. Or, as this poem suggests, they get wiped out. Or you can say they get assimilated by another group. Okay. Beowulf is the only thing keeping them all alive during his reign. We'll get to that one day. <laughs> so, he says, not so was Haramod. Second Haramod digression. I think there are going to be three. Just like there are three digressions about Helak and the Frisian raid. Okay? I think this is the second. Might actually be the third. Not so is Haramod. And he gives us, he tells us what Haramod did. But for their destruction, he grew not for their delight, but for their destruction and the murder of Danish men. That is, he became the killer of his own people. Enraged, the word in the Old English is yabolgen, if I remember correctly, and it means bellowed, 
like puffed up, enraged, he cut down his table companion, comrades in arms, until he turned away alone from the pleasures of men. Until he turned away alone from the pleasures of men, it's a big long euphemism, died. But what did he do before he died? Cut down his table companions. One of the things Beowulf is going to pray, give thanks to God for it with his dying breaths is, I never drunkenly slew my hearth companions. I wasn't a heroine. What else? That famous prince, though mighty, God exalted him in the joys of strength and force. God gave him lots of fortitude. Advanced him far over all men, yet in his heart he nursed a blood ravenous breast hoard. That is, he had something inside that said what? Kill, kill, kill. Could be Satan. Maybe we're being given a description of an early Germanic sociopath. No rings did he give to the Danes for their honor. What has he just violated? Lord Thane relationship. They go off and fight his battles. They bring the treasure back. He dispenses treasure. He didn't. That is why he is betrayed into his enemy's hands. He endured joyless to suffer the pains of that strife, a long-lasting arm to his people. Learn from him, understand virtue. Okay, Beowulf has just brought in Grindel's head. He's just killed Grindel's mother. He's probably still dripping. And what is Hrothgar warning him of? That was a good battle, son. Don't let it go to your head. You're the greatest thing that walks. Don't let it go to your head. You're the greatest warrior you ever lived. Don't let it go to your How do you not let stuff like that go to your head if people are just constantly praising you? Okay? For your sake, I'm telling this in the wisdom of my winters. Yes? Didn't Hrothgar tell Beowulf, like, oh, if you can do this, I'll give you everything? He said, I'm going to give you lots of treasure. He's going to do that in a few moments. Oh. He's going to give all the treasure after he gives the homily. Wait, so he's not giving who what? Uh, you lost me. <laughs> Wait, didn't he just say that somebody didn't give somebody something that they could do? Haramode did not dispense treasure to his thanes. He didn't give them what was due to them after they fought his battles. Back at line 1719. No rings did he give to the Danes for their honors. Okay. Hermod again is being held up as what? The ideal bad king. The anti king. Not anti meaning opposite, meaning the one who stands in the place of the false king, the usurper king. Not literally usurper, but the person who doesn't deserve to be king. So he says, I'm telling you this because of the wisdom of my winters. That is, I've lived a long time. And he gives us a story. And he's going to finish the story with thus. What's the story? It is a wonder to say how Almighty God, Mighty God in his great spirit, allots wisdom, land, and lordship to mankind. Notice, God does what? He gives wisdom, land, and lordship. To humanity. To all of us? No. How many of you are lords over somebody else? Okay. He has control of everything. Again, 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 God controls everything. At times he permits, and he tells us a story, somebody to be raised up who is young, wise, thoughtful, powerful, Strong, mighty. That person creates a stronghold of men. Creates a mighty hall, maybe. Okay? A great kingdom. So that, top of 108, line 1733, he himself cannot imagine an end to it. 
Louder? I said everything the light touches. Yeah, everything the light touches is yours or is mine. He can't think of an end to it. Why? Next half line. In his folly. What is folly? It's another word for it. The word that it's related to. Foolishness. What is often said about young people? Why do teenage boys, boys, men, till they're 25, have the highest automobile insurance rates? Of everybody. Keep going. Why are they reckless? Nothing can hurt me. Nothing can stop me. I can drive any way I want. And sometimes they do. Four kids, Oregon, a couple weeks ago, my, part of my family lives there. Racing, country highway, foggy, another car comes, four kids dead. All teenagers. Why? I'm invincible. This guy thought, what? It'll never end. He's at the top of everything. Today, who is that? Who could that be? Real world. It's not Joe Biden. Elon Musk? Jeff Bezos? Um, Gates? Pick your billionaire. They're where? They're at the top of the heap. He dwells in plenty. In no way plague him illness or old age. And time's up. Um, we'll pick up. I hoped I'd get you up at least as far as my next class, uh, first class. We're going to pick up there. We're going to, believe it or not, we're going to try and finish on Tuesday. If we don't, I'm going to have to finish it by a video sending you a pre-recorded message. Have a good weekend. Stop.